there were major tours which we kind of supported, if you like. Um, <laughs> if you ask Jeffrey Kruger, he'll say we, we didn't support them very well. But um, yeah, I mean, for every Marvin Gaye, there was then a junior walker doing um, clubs and, and Bailey's variety. Of course, there was Bailey Variety Clubs then, of course, were, was big for, for the middling Motown acts. All of those guys could work that circuit regularly. That, certainly, Junior Walker was one of the most prolific UK tours. I think he came three times during, during my time at Motown. Um, and you'd go, uh, that, that was my entree to American air bases. And that was a whole different world. Um, and then you'd have the bigger tours with Marvin. And then the Dyna Ross, uh, I, I worked on the Dyna Ross tour, which, was, which happened around the time of her movie, her second movie, Mahogany. Uh, Richard Williams at the Times, as were a lot of other journalists at that time, were besotted with James Jamieson, the bass player who was on the tour with Diana. And I got, Richard Williams promised me like the cover and the centre spread with an interview with James Jamieson. And in my naivety, you know, I, I thought of said, yeah, fantastic. And went to Berger sort of, to sort of arranging it. And, and Shelley said, no, we can't do that. You know, we detract from this Ross. So I started going, what the fuck are you talking about? How can he, de he's a fucking major player. How can he detract from Dinah Ross, a singer? Yeah, well, it won't go down very well. You know, she doesn't get the cover of Melody Maker and the bass player does. And I'm going, ugh. And, and stormed off and, and anyway the irony of it is that I think the next night or the night after that um, Jameson who was the, you know, a bit of an alcoholic actually got so pissed he fell off the stage in Birmingham or somewhere and was sent home now I've never known to this day whether he was sent home because he was a drunk or he was sent home because there was a danger he might get more publicity than Diana Ross the, the live show coverage was the main thing you get constant reviews quite easily but I mean as far as as far as uh, as far as as volume of coverage, press coverage goes, the best time I ever had at Motown, and I love telling this people, particularly Motown fans that you meet, all oh, used to work for Motown. Who is the greatest artist you ever worked with at Motown? And I have to say, in all honesty, that the best time I had was with Albert Finney, which was just fantastic. I mean, he used to take me out to lunch in, 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 um, in Covent Garden and other parts of London that, that he'd lived and regale me with stories about, you know, famous gay actors and, and, and to the hookers he used to live with in his first flat when he came down, you know, before he did Saturday night, Sunday morning. And he had made this album for Motown, as you probably can recall. Uh, and the co press coverage I got was just incredible. I mean, it's everywhere you get it covered. And, and I distinctly remember Jack Tinker, was it Jack Tinker of the Daily Mail, who was this formidable, legendary theatrical critic. And, and he gave, uh, he did a two page spread on, um, on Albert in the, in the Daily Mail, and, and then rang me up after he'd done the interview and said, thanks for that. But I have to say that you know, it, it really turns my stomach that the only way I can get him to do you know, an interview is, is to have to cover this wretched LP. <laughs> and Marvin Gaye was notoriously, um, <laughs> notoriously out to lunch even when he came on his first tour. And he was doing a Radio 4 interview, I think it was Radio 4, with Paul Gambaccini. And Gambaccini uh, at one point says to him, uh, we're all in this hotel room, I think, I think it was a Savoy, I can't remember, anyway, Krover Kruger had put him, but, um, and he says, well, um, it must have been so fascinating, you know, must for you to, to know that you were number one in Britain with Hurley through the grapevine, and, and so Marvin goes, I don't know, nobody told me, I didn't know, I didn't know I had, I had it in Britain, didn't know anything about it. But you had been to Britain before, you'd done Ready Steady in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't know. Didn't understand that at all. Nobody told me anything. But it must have generated a huge amount of income for you. Income? I don't know anything about income. And I was sitting in the, in the window. Of, 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 ask him. He knows about the income. He's the record company. He knows where my money is. I don't know where my money is. I don't get any money. And these are Radio 4 people. It wasn't live, obviously. But everyone was thinking, oh, Christ, we've got to do some editing here. And then, and, and he just carried on with the tour basically like that until the end of it, when he was when he was absolutely charming, and and he, he was just you could understand where his reputation as a ladies' man came because he was so utterly charming. He was, you know, he, he was just like the books that you read about him and say he was a he was just a, you know a complete personality schizophrenic. You know, he could just turn it on and turn it off, and uh, and drugs obviously made it worse.